From the OU TV Broadcast Center in Los Angeles, California, this is Brief News Brief, a brief look at today's trending news topics. Proudly combating the thought police since 2016, here's your host, James Heaney. I'm James Heaney, and this is your Brief News Briefing. We're back. We had a slight delay in broadcasting because our executive producer fell down a flight of stairs and she's now temporarily handicapped, okay? We're gonna try to stick to regularly producing these broadcasts, but bear with us, it might be spotty while she's in recovery. Now to the news. Donald Trump was scheduled to have a great peace summit in Singapore with the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in June. Last we reported, things were a go, and world peace was on the horizon. It was in the air. We were on the precipice of the future utopian world we all are waiting for. Since then, however, there have been some recent outbursts from the super stable, not a bad guy, really a lot like us, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And these outbursts might have completely derailed the talks. But that didn't stop the Trump White House, because the U.S. government has already minted a commemorative coin for the occasion. Now, these coins are featuring both of the leaders. And when I say featuring, it's already been pressed. We've got, we, I mean, I don't have a copy. And if you can get a copy, you should, because they're going to be worth some big bucks. Big bucks, the biggest bucks. But they have the picture of both of the leaders side by side on the front of the coin. And on the back of the coin, there's a plane flying over the White House. I don't know what the plane over the White House is about, but on the front of the coin, there's the, both of the leaders, they're eye to eye, and they're face to face, it's their profiles, it's like this, and they're just, it's just that moment, the picture's taken of this, it's right before they kiss, and it's a beautiful thing on this coin. Now, some people are upset that, you know, this is depicting two uh, world leaders, men, uh, staring deep into their eyes. And some say that it's because they don't want them to be equals. Because, you know, Kim Jong-un's a dictator and Donald Trump's a businessman and a, a, a president. The second thing is that it gives North Korea validation that they're looking for. They're pointing out that these guys are a nuclear power and they're on equal footing with us. We have a fancy commemorative coin celebrating peace, but the peace talks haven't even happened yet. And if those peace talks don't happen, those coins are going to be worth real big bucks. I'm talking, it's going to probably be more than Bitcoin. I don't know. It's going to be a very, very, very worthy, worthy coin, okay? <sighs> Trump has acknowledged yesterday that these talks might not happen. If these talks don't happen, then the essence of these printed coins, just think about this for a moment, those printed coins are fake news, right? No summer vacation, oh, oh, I feel so bad for the government people. The Senate's traditional August recess is likely to be trimmed or possibly scrapped entirely. According to four Republican senators, Mitch McConnell will soon announce plans to gut the four-week recess. Now, there's no final decision that's been made yet. The caucus is still debating how many weeks of the recess to slash. There are some, you know, appropriations and confirmations that are backed up right now, and they have the mindset to power through those. This is an election year, though, and most of the time, August is a big month for reps to return to their home states and talk with their people and rally for, you know, votes. But McConnell and the president and the GOP senators claim that they're so frustrated with the pace of spending bills and Trump's nominations that McConnell appears ready to pull the plug on the traditional getaway from Washington ahead of the midterm elections this fall. The move has the side benefit, it's not the purpose, definitely not on their mind, but the side benefit of keeping 10 vulnerable Senate Democratic incumbents in town during the summer, while their Republican rivals campaign against them back at home. Schumer and McConnell have been discussing this cancellation, and Schumer said, he and I are talking about that, and look, I think what's important here is to move the Senate forward on appropriations, and we Democrats have every intention of doing that and cooperating. This is a pretty good Schumer impression, right? The House on Tuesday passed a plan to roll back banking regulations passed in response to the 2008 financial crisis, sending the bill to President Trump's desk, and he can sign it into law. This marks the most significant weakening of the Dodd-Frank banking regulations since they were passed in 2010. 
The bill leaves most of the major pieces of post-financial crisis rules in place, and it doesn't touch the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a watchdog agency created after the financial crisis. The measure's supporters say it provides needed relief to the community and local banks struggling with regulations, but critics charge that it opens the doors to financial systems back up to the same abuse and risky behavior that flatlined our economy just less than a decade ago. Under the bill, banks with more than $50 billion would now be exempt from some regulations. These regulations are exempt as long as they undergo a yearly stress test to prove that they could survive another onslaught of economic turmoil. Now, banks with less than $10 billion in assets are going to be allowed to gamble again with their own assets. Some banks no longer have to disclose who they lend to. The banking industry has complained that all of these regulations are so annoying. And Congress listens. See, government can work. Work for banks. Okay, government works for banks a lot. For this next segment, it's probably appropriate for you to have the children leave, and we don't usually say that, but this is what I would consider a scarier story. So go, 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 go. All right. Now, as you know, we're adults and we don't have a lot of unnecessary fears, like snakes, sure. We're not scared of them. They're an annoyance at worst. But what if I was to tell you that there were giant shark worms invading France, right? The hammerhead flatworm. It grows to a foot or more in length. We're talking about the forearm sense here, traveling through the dirt and mud, showing up in European vegetable gardens. These are predatory worms. They're native to Asia, where they eat other worms. We're talking about cannibal hammerhead worms. Worms like these are spreading and are going to continue to spread, especially with increased global trade. It's a hammerhead worm invasion just like a hammerhead shark, except this hammerhead flatworm swims through soil to hunt, just like the hammerhead shark swims through water. Now, their soft bodies, they are not cuddly. Their soft bodies are chemical factories. They produce small amounts of a poison, a substance called tetrodotoxin, and they immobilize their prey so they can eat them alive as they cannot move. Most flatworms damage humans indirectly by eating so many earthworms that it ends up damaging the land. Now, I, don't, I haven't heard of anybody being eaten by these hammerhead flatworms, but my guess would be that that's their approach to humans. You might want to research it yourself. The most surprising things about these hammerhead flatworms that have been discovered is that these giant worms have been sneaking around in Europe for decades unnoticed by scientists. Sure, there had been a couple Johnny Do Goods growing gardens being like, I think I see a hammerhead thing, or some young kids, and scientists would always be like, poo poo, that's impossible, they're not from around here. But recently, some children found some that they thought were a bunch of snakes, but it turns out it's official. These are hammerhead worms, and they're invading France. Who's next? New York's Taxi King has agreed to cooperate with federal investigators. On Tuesday, a New York taxi operator pled guilty to improperly pocketing $5 million in state tax money and agreed to cooperate with federal prosecutors as they investigate President Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen. Yevgeny... Gene Friedman, a.k.a. the name we all know him by, the Taxi King, pled guilty to criminal tax fraud. He was basically the manager of all the taxis that Cohen owned. Cohen owned? Cohen entered the taxi business in the 1990s buying up valuable taxi medallions, which are required to operate in New York City and other large cities, but the value of these taxi medallions at one point in time reached a high of $1.2 million each in 2014. But their value has since slumped faster than Bitcoins. They're riding around 300000 now. Why? Because of things like Uber and Lyft giving you options in large cities, or any city for that matter, so you don't have to be strong-armed by a taxi driver. The scam is kaput. The investment that they made it completely flatlined. The taxi cling, the, the taxi cling, the taxi king, or maybe I should pronounce it, the taxi king declared bankruptcy on his uh, some of his medallions in 2016. And last year, he was charged by the New York State Attorney General with theft. When the taxi industry began to take a hit, 
to cut costs, the taxi king decided it would be a good idea to just lie and cheat. There's a 50 cent per ride tax owed to the state in every taxi. Well, in 2012, the taxi man started to create false tax returns to lie that he had paid that fee. He did this for a number of years, and now the gig's up. It's time to pay the fare, taxi man. Thank <laughs> you.